Thank you for joining this uh, second webinar you have. Welcome back to everyone who joined us in our first webinar. And also welcome to the newcomers. Um, this is a nice series that we'll be doing to guide you guys through different um, settings and different features we have on uh, our ICAM Foundation. Uh, my, na my, my name, and I'm your host, uh, Daniel. I'll be joined with my colleague, Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, who will be driving most of the presentation this evening. Um, so this we second webinar, we'll be discussing about some quality and features inside of Jenner that will help you debug your post processor to output the code uh, and output the correct codes during all each events that you're expecting um, so that your machine can work to your expectations. Um, just as a heads up, we will be taking questions during the um, presentation, but we'll, we'll try to answer them um, at most of the questions at the end. If you, if you do have any questions you want to fire away, uh, you can get put the questions up on this Q&A as you can see on your screen right now. Uh, and without further ado, I'll give this, uh, I'll give the time to Alex to start the presentation. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we will dive in right away. So I'm gonna bring up my, uh, my Genere and then once you have selected your, uh, your NCI file and you are, uh, you are ready to post, this is the default layout you'll see. This is the first time you ever start Genere. It will look like that. You'll have three windows, the input, the output, and the console window. So every time you click in one of those window, you're gonna process one line from that window. So if I click in the input once, I just process a part node in the input and it can give me multiple lines in one of the other window or no line at all. As we can see, we have multiple lines in the output and we have uh, no error or no message or warning. If I click one time in the output, nothing happened in the other because this is strictly coming from the, uh, the post and not from the, uh, the actual source file. If I click in the console, it's gonna run until I have either warning, an error, or a message, or the end of the file. If there's nothing wrong with the process, then we'll, uh, we'll keep running until it's over. So for a user perspective, this is plenty enough. You have your output where you see what's going to be your uh, NC code you're going to put on the machine. And you have your console where you see if there's any error that you need to, uh, to fix in the uh, CAM software. But for a post-processor developer perspective, this is not enough. You don't have enough control of that. So today we'll see what are those tools you, can, uh, you have access to to develop your post correctly and debug it. Uh, to have the correct output to send to the machine. So we have what we call the diagnostic window. So every message you have here will be sent to the diagnostic window with more information that you can check. You can review those file, uh, those message and just discard them if you don't need them. Then we have the source window, which is mainly the, uh, the process file from MasterCamp, Katya, uh, and X, you'll have those, uh, all the statesmen that comes from the CAM software to be able to generate your output. Then we have the variable window that will uh, gives you all the, uh, the variable of the post processor, what's their, their current state at the moment you are in the post. Then the call stack, which will uh, let you know if you are inside multiple uh, macros, which they are, and you can double click on that macro when they appear to jump to that macro to see where exactly it triggered a new macro. So first time you'll open those, those windows, it's gonna be really cluttered. You, you don't really see something useful, so you can move them around. So here, I'm gonna load up a layout that I already have set up. This is the lay layout I'm the most comfortable with to work when I'm debugging a post. So you can stack them together. So since the console and diagnostic, it's mainly the same thing, but with more information on diagnostic, 
I have them on the, uh, both stacked up together, so I can just choose between the two of them. So first thing we'll do, we'll, uh, we'll save that layout. Once you have set it up, you save the layout and mine is layout number two. So if I click on number two, I'll be able to save that layout. So we'll run the post just to gener uh, generate all the message we have. So we don't have errors, which is actually good, but we do have warnings and we have messages. So we'll check them out and see what we can do with that. You can sort them out to, uh, by the type. So we'll check those message. Okay, so we have the cutcom, fixture compensation is already on for this coordinates to, with this offset common process. So some of the CAM system will output uh, a cutcom uh, on or cutcom uh, on adjust on every operation or tool change that you have, which might not be necessary, uh, necessary, but uh, some of the user will want to have uh, a G54, for example, output at every operation. So if they need to rerun that operation on the machine, they have all the safety codes. But for this specific uh, post, we don't necessarily uh, need it. There's very, uh, various way of handling that. We can have some uh, variable, uh, some uh, post processor function that will prevent the, the output of the message, or we can have macros that will, uh, that will handle the uh, on and off function of the cutcom. So depending on how you want to have your post set up, you can uh, do with that, but this would be for another webinar. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna right click on it and Mark has reviewed and I can either just the one that I selected, the one with the same ID, uh, you have to be careful with that one because sometimes you can have a message with one ID that will have a different string. So if you have an over travel on uh, the X axis and on the Y axis, it will have the same ID, but not the same message. So usually what I go is Mark has reviewed with the same message then all my message cutcom has been reviewed. And if I don't want to see them, I can hide them. So I only see those that I have not reviewed yet. So here we have the spindle, exceed maximum allowed for this gear, and coolant option missed, not supporting by this machine. So again, depending on how you do your, uh, how you do your process, your process can be specific to a machine or can be uh, available for multiple machine. So you'll want to take decision at that point. Do I handle it through the, uh, with the post or do I handle it with the CAM software? So if you want to handle it through a post, you can just set it up that if I have a coolant miss for the specific post, well, turn, uh, I would change it to a coolant flood through a macro or just through an M code. So, okay, those are not critical uh, message, but I wanted to know about that. So I'm gonna review them and then we're good. So let me on a hide. I wanna check that spindle. If I right click on the message, can click on synchronize and it's gonna show me in all the other window where it is coming from. So here I have my spindle for a 5,000 RPM clockwise. It's pretty fast, but maybe my, my machine can support that. But this specific one is set to 30,000. So we see the output is 30,000. So Jenner will lower the RPM to your maximum value if uh, the, uh, the requested spindle is higher than the maximum allowed. So I've seen that I can synchronize with a message, but I can also synchronize inside of any uh, window. So if I have a console, I could synchronize with one of my specific console, or I can sp I can synchronize in the source, and it will show me where it is outputting. The only place where I cannot synchronize is inside of a macro itself. So I have done my pro uh, my process. Uh, usually, if you ha if you are debugging, you might have to run it multiple time. Uh, if you have run completely the process, you, I won't be able, uh, you won't be able to, sh uh, to do what I'm about to show you. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna restart the process. So if you are not 
finish on the, on the process, you can use different options to move around. First one, you can jump to the cursor. That means that you will position the, uh, the source file at this location without processing it to that location. Or if you are already past it, you can go back to that location and just rerun it again if you wanna see what's the flow of the macro, the flow of the, of the variables, and how it outputs. If I go jump to this location here, if it's not done, it's gonna, it's gonna process. But if it's already processed, you're gonna go back and you're gonna reprocess it again. So it's mainly just for debugging. This is not, you, you shouldn't use that for the actual output. Uh, you can also right click run to cursor. So it's gonna do the same thing if it's uh, going forward. You need to be careful though when you use jump to because the state that the post was before doing the, the jump to will be the state the post is when you have done the, uh, the jump to. So if you are compare, uh, comparing your previous location or your current position and the next position, you will have some differences between what's uh, actually what happened if you were running it normally and if you, uh, between, uh, compared to what you would have by using the jump to. So usually we recommend to use a jump to for a load statement or op type statement where you would interrogate the post to see what's your current status and then start your operation and your normal behavior. Then we have those buttons here at the top of the source window. So the first one is step into. So the step into will process the line and if it triggers a macro, you will step inside the macro to see what, uh, what's gonna happen. You can also press F11 on the keyboard to, uh, to process that. So here, I don't trigger a macro, so I just process the line. My go-to though, oh, I have a macro there, so it did process it, and I have went inside to see what the, what's it. So if I keep going, F11, it's gonna process each and every single line one at a time. If I go back to my go-to, I also have what we call the step over. So it's gonna process the line without stepping in any macro that would be triggered by this. So if I press on F10, which is the keyboard function for that step over, it processed the go-to without going inside of it, which we know that we have a logical uh, question inside of that go-to. And then we have what we call the step out function. So if I go back to my go to, or if I go with my step out, which is F12, it's going to process, it's going to run the macro uh, until the end of that macro and stop there. So this, as we've moved uh, with the F11, 10 and 12, we've seen that we have some variables that have been changing, that we have some windows that have been activated. So let's talk a little bit about that variable window. So we have on the left-hand side four tabs. One's called auto. The auto tab will list the variables that's been currently used up to a certain, some couple, a couple of steps before the current line you are in the macro. So you're able to see what was the previously used variable just to keep a look on the flow of what's happening. But those are available elsewhere too. So if you have global variable, uh, global variable are activated, uh, are accessible throughout of the post uh, and you can see them at any time of the post as soon as they have been initialized. Same thing for the object variable. Uh, the difference between the two of them is mainly between uh, for campos with the simulation. So for, for you guys on foundation, global and object variables are the exact same thing. And then you have local variable, that if you have local variable inside of that macro, they will be listed there. And as soon as you step out from that macro, that list will empty itself. You also have the watch window where you can set different macro either by double clicking on the, uh, 
uh, on a text box and just entering, well, I want to see what's my spindle speed. So dollar S and right now we at 30,000. Or if you have macro in the tabs, you can just click, uh, click and drag to put them on your watch list and they will update as they are uh, modified in the post. So the next thing I want to talk about is the breakpoints. So I might want to run to a specific position uh, to see because I know already what's happening before that. And I want to know, I want to step in in details on the, uh, in the macro from a spe uh, specific location. For example, here I have my load tool. Well, I want to process up to my load tool. So I can put breakpoints. As you've seen, just click on the left hand side of the window. Uh, by default, uh, you will not have the line number. So if you want to see what's the line number, you just right click in the source, show line number, and then you'll have the lines. It's easy to, uh, it's easier to manage your macro. It's, ma it's easier to manage your macro uh, at that uh, if you have the lines uh, for that. So you can click, like I said, on the load tool. And if I press play, it's gonna run all the way to there and then stop. I can also, uh, if I have, if I'm running like multiple iteration of that, of that process because I'm doing some modification to the post, sometimes you might not want to have that breakpoint, but you don't want to, uh, you don't want to remove it because uh, you might need it l uh, later, so you can. Shift click on it and if, let me just step more and then it's empty instead of being red. That means the breakpoint still exists, but if I would be uh, moving forward, it will bypass it. It won't, it won't stop at that point if I was before. And then I can re uh, shift click to reactivate it. And if I click on the red button, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna remove it. Also, if you have multiple one and you want to remove everything, so when you are uh, ready to do your real uh, post processing, you would want to remove all breakpoints. You have the remove all breakpoints at the top. So I just click on that, it's gonna remove, uh, remove everything. Then you have a little bit more control in the breakpoint manager. So breakpoint manager uh, lets you put breakpoints using the lines, using a specific macro without having to, na uh, to navigate inside of the source window. You can just say, okay, well, I want my tool start up and then what's the line I wanna go. If you know what's the line, you just enter your line, let's say line 10, I close, go to my tool startup. Well, then line 10 is a comment. So Jenner is gonna put the breakpoint on the next uh, on the next line that is not a common. So here we have the breakpoint for line 11. And it updates also in the breakpoint list. You can also put some records. So if I want to go spindle, every time I go to a spindle, I would go, we'll just go spindle, add every time you have a spindle, it will stop at uh, that line and then you can single step to be sure that everything is okay. Then we have the CL, uh, the CL records. So CL records are the, uh, from the source window. If I go back here in the source, you have those numbers here. So if you know which number you want to stop, you can enter that number and it's going to put the breakpoint there. Same thing for variables, either global, uh, local. Uh, if you are inside of that macro at that point, you can set a local. Uh, but be, uh, take note that as soon as you step out of that macro, it will, uh, it will not be accessible anymore uh, until you re-step inside of that macro at a later time. Uh, we have what we call the dollar P variables. 
those are local variable. So, and they are already there for you inside of a post. So if you say dollar P1, well, dollar P1 will be uh, matching for multiple uh, macros. So you have to be careful because that means every time you'll step in macro, if you have a dollar P1, it will stop at that dollar P1. So you have uh, you have to be careful with what you uh, what you use. Then you also have the diagnostic. Yeah, if I have a specific message that I want to stop, I can select that message and then it will stop if I encounter that message. And for the event for foundation, you we don't use the event because this is for the simulation only. We can have the breakpoint if we have a collision or over travel. So the uh, disable, uh, disabling, reactivating, and deleting of the macro are also available here, or I can just disable by checking it out, or reactivate it by rechecking the, uh, the checkbox, or by clicking delete to delete what I have to do. The next thing would be the controller, which I didn't show you yet. So the controller window, let me make it bigger so we can see what's happening. So right now we don't have any code active, but if I go back and process a little bit, there we have a bunch of codes. So you see what's the G codes that are being active and what's the M codes that are being active. So right now I have my spindle clockwise, but I don't have any coolant. So it might be something that I need to check. Why do I not have coolant? Well, I see that I have my coolant option missed here. So it's probably one of the error. Uh, that's probably the error. So I would have to go back again, depending if I want to handle it through the cam system or through the post is up to me and just check why do I not have my coolant? Okay, so I have my G54 active. I have, uh, I am in the cycle off. Uh, my land comp is active, that's okay. I'm in absolute value and I'm in feed rate right now. So you have all those codes available to you. Then you have the PP fund. So those are the post processor functions that will tell you more information about the, uh, about the post. Those that are in blue are active. They have something that has been uh, set. So you can click on them and see what's happening. So right now we don't, we're saying we don't, we have it set to off, so we are not using it. Uh, this one is uh, set to on. So you can see if we have any information about them, you'll be able to see uh, what uh, post processor function is active. So for example, if I go in my post, my machine startup, I have a bunch of warning and messages. So I'm gonna, re-enable them, compile, and if I rewind, and go to my PP font 15, and just go to the source, then I have, those are there. So if I go to my Secno, just process them, and right now I have processed the first three. If I go back to my control, I see that those are off. So you're able to see what uh, post-processor function has been activated, so you can easily uh, debug your post. Then afterwards, if you wanna see what's the flow of how a block is being uh, built up, there's two ways of doing it. You can have the $MCD variable. So $MCD is basically what's the variable you're gonna be sending to the, uh, what's the, uh, the block you're going to be sending to the tape. So as it builds up, you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to see what's happening. So right now I've put a trace when the, on the variable. So every time that variable will change, it will stop the post processing to let me know what's the uh, what's the change. And I can just run it. Now, okay. So the first part is mainly uh, inserts and uh, automatic output. So can't really do anything about it. But right now, okay, I have N31 G9, uh, G94. So I see that right now, this is what I have 
that I will, will be outputting. And once I process something else, I might have something, uh, I will have more information. You also have the step details here. So when I have the step details, if I click in the output window, I see as they build up how they appear. This can be useful to, if you want to separate some information from one line to another, uh, you'll, uh, the first thing you need to check is how that information is being built up. So you can say, okay, well at this specific point, I need to output uh, my current block so I can split it up from the rest. So again, this is a subject that we will touch in a further uh, webinar concerning macro programming uh, and uh, some tips and tricks on how to use those macros. And as long as the line is green, that means that you have not outputted to the tape yet. As soon as the line is not green anymore, that means the tape has been done, it has been released, and you are, uh, you will start processing the uh, next line. So one of the questions that came up, are there limitations belong, uh, belong size of the CLS file for debugging? Uh, no, there's no limitation except the amount of RAM you have learning on your machine. Obviously, if you have a really long uh, file, your machine might not be able to handle it because it is stored in the RAM when we, uh, when we load it and when we process it. But if you have, I would say over 16 gig on a, of RAM on the machine is more than enough to be able to uh, post-process and do your debugging. Other question, how do you manage the CL record if some data is missing? Uh, means not every CAM software pass on all information. Uh, with uh, mainly, I would say, NX and CATIA, some of those information are available, uh, can be available through the PP table for CATIA or uh, UDEs, uh, so user defined events in uh, NX. You can build those to output the information you need to have. Uh, if not, some uh, there's a lot of information that are not necessarily useful for Genera at first, but they are commented out in the output file. So we see that information. It's just that since it's not uh, it's not useful uh, necessarily, what we do is that we comment it out, but it, we still have access to it. For example, let me just share my screen again. If I go to my source, right now this is, what I have loaded is an NCL master count file, which is a uh, binary format, if I remember correctly. If I go and ask it you, here I have all the information that's being output from master count. But I don't need necessarily all those information. For example, those 1020s are codes that master count output to let the user know what kind of information is being passed on, and then we have the value that comes with that code uh, underneath. So us, we take the information we need, but it is still accessible uh, through a little bit of macro uh, tweaking to be able to access those information. For Katia, uh, you would have them as a dollar dollar so it used the same format as well we use the same format as what katia use which is the uh, iso apt format uh, so you would have access to those if you uh, if you are reading a line so through macro programming you're able to catch it and then process what you need to process uh, for an x uh, like I said, with UDE, you can easily pass on. Uh, you can easily pass on information to the post to gather that information. So here, what I've done is just 
the show the ISN reference, those are, uh, as you can see, you have the information. So if, even if you have a line that's being uh, not used by, uh, by Campost, uh, you still have the record number, uh, the class record and sub record available to you to get that information. So you would have to write down a macro that would uh, catch that record and sub record and then you can pass it on to a variable and do whatever you need to do. So if there's no more question, uh, we will uh, close down this webinar. Again, if you have more question that comes up as, uh, as you're reviewing the video or that just comes up later on, you can always send us an email and we will answer, you th uh, answer that question for you. So again, thank you so much for coming today. And uh, we hope to see you again on the next webinar that should be in two, two, uh, two weeks to a month. Thank you very much. Have a great day.